there are some people who went to Mombasa from Eastlands, Nairobi, and they began to pray. Walianza kuomba hivi kwa Kiswahili. Mazee God tunajua uko area. Tunajua tukianza kubonga na wewe, I see how to slake. Hey, Mombasa Knights was saying, Asalal, <laughs> what is this today? So I don't want to take that on YouTube today. I want to be in my best English, my best Swahili. If you're recording, let me know <laughs> so that I put my best foot forward. But be that as, as it may, I want to introduce to you Asaf as a great man whom I admire greatly in the work that he does. And my way of introducing Asaf to you I want to introduce him to you as a mentor, a person who brings up another generation of his own children spiritually and physically to do what he was doing and to even supersede his abilities and his success. Asaph, when you read him in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, you find that he's one of the three men that this man called David chose to bring together their sons, their children, and to be mentored. Why don't you just look briefly before we delve into this Psalm 73, look at First Chronicles chapter 25, so that you have an idea of what I am talking about. As this one's walking, we look at Psalm, no, First Chronicles chapter 25 to introduce to us the man Asaph. We thank God for our brothers who are walking in, Karibu Sana, you found the introduction of the message. So I believe that you have a portion in what we are talking about. I wish that you can settle in so fast so that we can look at First Chronicles 25. First Chronicles 25 verse 1 says, David, together with the commanders of the army, set apart some of the sons of Asaph. So when he talks about the sons of Asaph, it means that they are his children in a sense whether they are spiritual children or they are ministry children or they are physical children there are some people who followed Asaph they were his disciples there were people who were younger than him whom he mentored and helped them to come to the level where he was and did it even better listen the sons of Asaph the sons of Haman the sons of Jeduthun for the ministry of prophesying accompanied by harp liar and symbol he here is the list of the men who performed at this service now let's settle it in our minds that david together with the commanders of the army bring aside asaph and other two gentlemen and say bring your children bring your sons the people that you're mentoring so that we can sharpen their skills and help to sharpen your own skills as you continue to sharpen the skills of these people and the particular vein of ministry and trade that these men were specialized in was prophetic ministry and the music ministry. So Asaph was a prophet of God. Asaph was a temple musician. He was able to bring a prophetic word into the house of God and to the king and to the nation. But he was also able to lead the children of Israel in worship and in praise. <clears throat> Verse 2. From the sons of Asaph, these are the names, Zakur, Joseph, Nathaniah, Asariah. The sons of Asaph were under the supervision of Asaph, who prophesied under the king's supervision. So look at that picture. King David is the mentor of Asaph, the mentor of Jeduthun, the mentor of Haman. And these three mature men are the mentors of 288 younger people underneath them. You'll discover the number is 288 as you read the verses down there. There are many, many young people that were being mentored by this thing, by this, by this arrangement. And so the picture that I see here is taking from your father in the Lord, taking from those who are senior in the things of God and receiving them and being able to pass them on to another generation. And I believe that this is the attempt of what is happening here today. And so I picked on Asaph to speak about holiness because even holiness and righteousness and a way of living and conversation can be picked from a mentor. 
and you can be influenced by somebody who is higher than you. And so Asaf is a specialist in the prophetic ministry, he's a specialist in prophetic ministry, he's a specialist in huge music ministry, some people call it here music industry, gospel industry, it is not in an, an industry, it is a ministry. Approach it as a ministry and you'll go far. Verse 3 says, as Jeduthan from the sons, uh, these are his sons listed there. And then verse 4 says about Haman, and those are the sons listed there. Verse 5 says, all these were the sons of Haman, the king's seer. They were given him through the prof promises of God to exalt him. God gave Haman 14 sons and three daughters. Verse 6, all these men were under the supervision of their father in the music of the temple of the Lord. And then with symbol, lyre, harp for the ministry of the house of God. Asaph, Jeduthan, and Haman were under the supervision of the king. So the sweet psalmist of David was the one that was shaping the ministry of Asaph that we are reading today. So I want you to be settled in, my, in your minds as I introduce Asaph to you so that you can see what caliber of man that he was as we talk about his story here today in Psalm 73. I've gone back to Psalm 73 because it begins by saying a psalm of Asaph. So you understand now we are dealing with a mentor. And at any given time, if you're leading the nation of Israel in any function and the entire nation is there, you're probably leading a whole host of about three million people. And so when you think about a leader of millions and millions of people, this is a very important person, a very reliable person that we need to look up to. He is not one of those guys that is just trying out in ministry. He is not a, a novice. He is not an inexperienced person. He is a very experienced person. That in the whole nation, when people are chosen and the audition is happening, three people's name come up and Asaph is one of them. A very high-ranking guy in terms of spirituality. He is a mature person. In terms of skill and ability, he is a very capable person. In terms of all dimensions that you can look about, he is a very key person in every regard that you can think about. And he begins by telling us that God is good to Israel and those that are of a pure heart. That is his experience. And the words of a leader are very important. They are influential people. In our country, we see when leaders, political leaders say one thing, the whole nation goes that direction. When they shake hands, only shaking hands, the nation goes another direction. And there's all sorts of influences that leadership and fatherhood and motherhood has. People who are over you in the Lord, they have influence over you and they've got great impact over your life. And so Asaf says to us that God is good to Israel. You've got a reason to believe this. Maybe he's meditating about how God saved Egypt, Israel from the nation of Egypt with a mighty hand through the hands of a, of, a, of a guy who was a stammerer, Moses. And he meditates about these things and he comes to one conclusion that God is good to the Jewish nation. He is so concerned about this and tells us all this goodness that God has given to us and we've seen the history of Israel. You can think about Esther, you can think about Daniel, you can think about Joseph, you can think about so many instances that God showed his goodness to the nation of Israel. And I actually concur with him because some few years when I was a small, small boy, something happened here in Kenya in relation to Israel. Israel, Jewish people, were arrested and they were being mishandled by Idi Amin Dada in Uganda. And so, those of us who have another generation, you can understand that the Israelis, the Jewish people, they decided to come from Israel and come to uh, this Wilson Airport in Nairobi. And they refueled their planes there. And they made such an arrangement to fly into Uganda incognito that they flew so low the radars in Entebbe could not detect their planes and they entered into Uganda without the nation of Uganda, the authorities in Uganda noticing that they were there and they got in, they camouflaged, they behaved as though the president was coming to the airport, they took this limousine that looked like Idi Amin's limousine and they drove through and somehow they saved many Jewish people 
who were being kidnapped and being tortured by Idi Amin in Uganda and they put them in the plane. Only two of them were left there dead. Benjamin Netanyahu's brother is called Bibi Netanyahu. He died and another lady who died in hospital, she was a Jewish lady, she died in hospital there. But they flew out and flew into Tel Aviv in Israel within a short while. Idi Amin did not know how this happened because people had evacuated the country and he had no idea how they did it. But Kenya was involved by helping them to come here and getting into Uganda and out and back into Israel. And that's why I really believe we need to continue maintaining a good relationship with Israel because this scripture is there. God is good to Israel. And those who bless Israel will be blessed. I've had the privilege of standing in Jerusalem and blessing the city of Jerusalem and say, God, I bless Jerusalem. May you bless Kenya. And Kenya is blessed because we're connected to Israel in a vital way. But he also says, not only does Israel experience the goodness of the Lord, that the miracles and the wonders of the Lord follow Israel, but the wonders and the goodness and the favor and the goodness of the Lord follows those that walk in a pure heart, those that live a pure life will attract the same blessings that Israel attracts. That verse 1 says so. And I believe that this man was in meditation and worshipping the Lord when he's talking about the goodness of God to Israel and the goodness of God to those that walk in holiness and purity and righteousness. Let me tell you, my young brothers and sisters, that if you will walk in holiness, in purity, and in fear of the Lord, you will see great things happening in your life. God will do great things for your life. It was back in 1988 when somebody told me these words that I need to tell you now. A prophet of God came to me when I was discouraged and I was thinking this Christianity is not going to work for me. And I was saying that I'll come back from this camp meeting, these rallies, I will, I will just go back to my old lifestyle and forget about this. And a man whom I cannot remember his name, a man who did not know so much about me, he came to the room where, he, where I was. And he says God has spoken to him to speak to me. And he says that God has said that if you do not give up, you will see great things in your life. That's what lifted my spirit up because I said, how did God send this guy? How did he know that I was so discouraged and I was going to give up on Christianity all the same? And he came with that prophetic word. He injected it into my spirit. I still feel it in my heart today and I am so compelled to continue living for God because I have seen some few great things in my life. And I want to continue to see great things even in the days to come. I repeat this word that he spoke to me again. Young people, if you do not give up on God, you will see the goodness of the Lord like it says in this verse 1. God is good to those that are pure in heart. And you get pure in heart by being washed by the blood of Jesus. You get pure in heart and you walk in holiness after you're washed in the blood of Jesus. You continue to walk in the ways that eschew evil and shun wickedness and avoid the things that hurt the heart of God and walk in the things that please the Lord by obeying the scriptures. The scripture would say, how can a young man keep his ways pure? By guarding them according to your word. That is how you remain pure, pure and you attract the blessings of the almighty God. Now listen to what I think about verse 1. Verse 1 is where this man opens his jacket, his heart, on one side and is showing us the side that is wonderful, the side that is good. When he's worshipping God, he's showing you the best part where I was saying he put his best foot forward. Because he knows people can see him and God can see him. He's worshipping God and he's revealing to us, wow, it is so wonderful to serve God. If you serve God, you will see what Israel saw. You can come out of the den of lions like Daniel saw. You can go into Egypt as a young man of age, age 17 like Joseph did and end up to become the prime minister of the land if you serve the Lord and avoid evil like Joseph did. God will exalt you even if you're in prison. God will still bless you and give you favor. He's showing us as he's worshiping God and meditating upon the Lord that I'm a recipient of the goodness of the Lord and the blessings of the Lord. If you walk with the Lord, he meditates with us and he's worshiping God and said, I remember Esther, a young girl who was beautiful. Even another queen was removed so that Esther can come in and Esther saved the whole nation from distinction, extinction and she, she became a, a role model to so many and he worships God 
God as he thinks about these great deliverances of Egypt, out of Egypt into the Red Sea and the provision of food for 40 years, the provision of clothing for 40 years, the provision of a, of a covering over the night, a light and, and, and a pillar of fire in the night and a cloud during the day in the wilderness for 40 years. He says, God is good to Israel. And those that are of a pure heart will see the goodness of the Lord. And he worships the Lord because his eyes are set upon Jehovah. And he's loving the Lord as he's showing us the wonderful side of his testimony. And allowing us to see the good part of his life. Like many of us will testify of the goodness of the Lord in your lives. And you'll tell us the miracles that God has performed in your life. And we can go on. I for one, I can tell you how God has blessed me with pieces of land. And God has blessed me with different kinds of vehicles and God has blessed me and given me miracle surprises financially and I can go on and on and on and on and show you the wonderful side of my story but I need to say to you even though I had a wonderful amen here that is not the end of the story now that amen is weak but don't worry it is going to come soon there is the other side of the story the other side that is not so glamorous, it is as folded and as creased as this chart of mine down here because it was tucked in here. There are some things that are hidden in our lives. There is a part of us as we mentor other people, as we reveal ourselves to people, we not only show the good side, but we also need to show the weak side so that people can understand even those of us who hold the, pulp, hold the microphone at the pulpit, there is a weaker side, there is, there is a human side of life. I remember preaching at my mother's funeral, not no, no, the, his, the funeral, yes, not at the burial. I remember preaching, her body was lying on the table there, and I preached and people got saved, and I felt like I'm a man of God. I can preach. And I preached again another night, and people got saved. There were many people coming to the Lord every night, and my uncle said I should preach during the burial. That is when I realized I am just but a human being because when the casket carried the body of my mother, when they closed it up and they began to sing those funeral dirges, those hymns that are sung by the PAG church, as you go in the procession in the western part of Kenya where I come from and people begin to cry and you can hear, when I saw all that sorrow engulfed my soul and I remember holding my elder brother on his arms and that sorrow, the grief that gripped me was so much, I began to weep and I realized that I'm just a boy, a young man in the family that has lost the mother and all this preaching that I was doing here, trying to show off that I can preach to some people and people will get saved. It was just to show off to people. I needed to come to terms that I'm still a human being that can go through pain and through sorrow and I can fall down and I need other people to pick me up. Apostle Paul will agree with me when he says that in his experience of going to the upper limits and going to the upper heavens, the third heavens, there's a moment in time that comes that he has a thorn in the flesh for which he prays three times. He calls it a messenger of Satan. He does not even want to reveal what it is for us to know what you're suffering from. But he tells us it's a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him, sent to torture him. And Paul reveals to us there is a side of me even if I raise the dead, even if you call me apostle so and so and give me so much titles, there is a side of me that is human, it is weak and I need you to see both sides of me, the strong and the weak so that as I mentor you in these things you can understand both sides am I talking to human beings here today I am not so impressed about fake Christianity where we stand up to only give the victory side of the story and we talk about how we conquered how God provided how God intervened and how we are successful but we do not talk about how we struggled through that pain how we struggle through overcoming masturbation. How we struggle through overcoming those moments of temptation, sexual temptations, and overcoming the prideful feelings and, and tendencies and attitudes that we had. How we went through that. Some of these young people seated here want to hear what was your journey and how can I make it? University students, I need to 
to ask you to be sincere with our younger brothers and sisters. How do you handle the whole issue of sexuality, for example? How do you overcome if you overcome? Because I've stood in many universities in our country and especially around Nairobi and I've stood in many of these campuses in Christian Union meetings. I hardly speak to professors like him. I got a chance to do that recently when there was a funeral of one but I hardly get chances to speak to professors. I usually speak to Christian unions and I say the sexual behavior of those that are in Christian unions is not so different from the sexual behavior of those that are outside the Christian unions. And I stand up and I ask, is there anybody to challenge me on that thought? And from Kikuyu campus to Chiroma to Nairobi to Kenyatta to Jomo Kenyatta and Ruiru and all those universities that I've gone to, nobody has yet stood up to challenge me and say it is not true. So we need to know what are your struggles, how do you handle your struggles, how you do you go through them. And Asaf is offering us here today in Psalm 73 a glimpse of what he went through after worshipping God and focusing upon Jehovah and telling us the goodness of the Lord in the land of Israel and the goodness of the Lord for those that are pure in heart. He comes to verse 2. Verse 2 says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. In simple language, I was backsliding from the faith. Now let me ask you a question. After all the introduction I gave you about this man called Asaf, I want to ask you, a man of his caliber, I don't think that there is any of us who can reach the caliber of Asaf. I know that I'm on radio, I speak to millions of people on radio every morning. This morning I've been on radio and I'm sure we have influenced quite a lot of people. But it's not quite like Asaf who had the ability to prophesy, ability to play instruments, ability to sing and lead a whole nation in the worship of Jehovah. A man of that caliber still telling you that I am able to get tempted, I am able to begin to backslide. And he goes further and tells you in verse 3 how he was backsliding. He's very specific about his backsliding and his tendencies. He says, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Two scenes that I see there. There was envy on his heart. And he was looking the wrong direction. He was covetous of those people that are ungodly. He was looking the wrong direction. He stopped looking at God. He says, my brothers and sisters, I want to be very honest with you. If you check my heart very well, I have got something called wivu, envy. And I'm a leader of the nation of Israel. I lead three million people in worship and praise. But I've got envy in my heart. There is a secret sin that you can't see. I envy people. I'm envious and I'm covetous. And I'm not covetous of you Christians because you look like you're suffering anyway. But I'm covetous of those people outside there who seem to be doing well after taking the money of corruption. This is the Kenyan culture. When people steal millions and billions of shillings in this country and they go to court, a whole group of people, they say, Mtuetu, Mwiziwetu, Mtuetu, and they go there to protest because we worship thieves. Asaf, he's saying, I'm not an exception. I'm just like you Kenyans. I envied those people who were prosperous in wickedness, in sin. They did sinful things to get their prosperity. I envied them. He's telling you the truth. How many of your pastors, how many of your leaders can tell you these kinds of things of personal struggles, of personal challenges, of deep things that they go through? Some of the mature Christians who are in leadership in different places that you go to worship, how many of them that you interact with, they tell you, my sister, my young sister, look, this is what I struggled with. And I want to, and to, to, and to, and to challenge you. Those who are your spiritual mentors and leaders, ask them sometimes, how did you overcome A, B, C, D? And tell them, I'm struggling in this area. Help me to overcome this. Let me know some of the ways that you have failed and, and God has helped you to rise up again. Because the scripture says, a righteous man may fall seven times, but he will surely rise up again. We're like tennis balls. When we're hit down, we rise up again. We come up again. And Asaf says, that I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. 
Is there somebody who here who is willing to be honest with us and honest with themselves and before God and says, I'm going to show you both sides. There are times I'm so spiritual, I'm with it. I feel the presence and I feel the anointing. And I can see the goodness of the Lord God walking in my life. The hand of God is here with me. But I can also show you the other side of me where I have a thorn in my flesh. There are certain things that I'm struggling with. Apostle Paul, I love him because he says in Romans chapter 7, at the end of Romans chapter 7, he says there is a struggle that happens within my members. The things that I want to do, I cannot do them. And the things that I find myself doing are exactly the ones that I did not want to do. And he cries out and says, Oh wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? And theologically speaking, that struggle in Romans chapter 7 is not a struggle for baby Christians only. It is a struggle even for the mature Christians. It does not matter if you've been born again for 32 years like myself or you've been born again for two years or one month or two months. There will be a struggle between the flesh and the spirit. There will be a struggle between you and the enemy. There is always a struggle. Let me make another solemn statement here that you might want to write in your notebooks. The temptation and the devil are no respect of persons. It doesn't matter how anointed you are. You could be as anointed as that teen of Kimbo or Blue Band or Vaseline. You could be so anointed that when you walk, you'll walk like we used to walk with Mitei in Nairobi. And we felt so anointed those days after prayer. You even release your hands like this and you create a certain kind of vacuum here where your bones can actually hold soup here and another milk, milk liquid on, on this side and you're walking so anointed because you've been fasting and praying and you just feel like if demons just understand that you have arrived they will go away they will run because Ngaira and Mitei have arrived in the meeting professor it's okay for me to use your name eh? it does not matter how anointed you are temptations will come your way even the same mentor David, he was tempted when he saw a beautiful lady taking shower. And these showers, I wonder in ancient days, this guy goes on his roof and he can see the other compound from State House, Jerusalem. He can see the other side and there's a lady there who is just the way she was born. A bigger version of what she was born. A Coca-Cola ship. Now I don't want to paint pictures in your minds right now. But David, the mentor of mentors, the mentor of Asaph, he said and he says, Whoa, man! Mm, mm. And he sent a commission of inquiry. Go and find out who that woman is. They came back, they said, this is the wife of so-and-so. And he sent a, a, a mission strategy and says, bring her here. And they came back with the lady, they say, Nia leo, nia leo, nia leo, nia leo. And David, with all his anointing, and as a born and his idea ni sikule ikondo leo, and his idea ni sikule ikondo. But he takes it, and he's tempted, and he falls, and he tries to trick the husband to come and sleep with the lady so that they can cover up a bump that has now begun to develop and that man never slept in his house and so he made another strategy to go and put him in the front of the war and Uriah was killed and so he committed adultery he committed lies he committed murder he tried to cover up until a prophet Nathan came to him and he says where do you mekula kondo if David was tempted my brothers who is Ngaira let us walk in the fear of God let us walk with a sense of depending on the grace of God and say, God help me that I will not fall. Me, I want to finish well. And say like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. And I have kept my faith. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. To come to that point, it is by the grace of God. Let us walk in a way with a sense of dependence of God, on God and say, God, without your grace, we cannot make it because temptations are great and big. The devil, some principalities and powers exist. They can wait for you even for 20 years. They observe you, they observe you, they observe you, they observe you. And they know your weaknesses. And 20 years down the line, when I could take you fall down like Asaf, he says, my feet almost, he did not backslide, but he almost backslid. Let me take you further, verse 4. And I do not like reading verse 4 to verse 12. 
I do not like reading them. Look at a man who has backslidden, who's walking in sin and wickedness. And you know, my approach today to give you this message is for you to show you, for me to show you how a man fell and how a man came out of his sinful ways. That is what I want to do here today. Verse 4, look at the perspectives of the man. He says, they have no struggles, these wicked people. Their bodies are healthy and strong. It is true and it is not true. Sometimes I see there are sinners getting HIV AIDS. I see them suffering all sorts of diseases because of their lifestyle of sin. And this man is telling us that these people have got no struggles. They have a lot of struggles. They don't sleep at night. I know I knew of a politician in Kenya whom when he was booked in a room, he would make sure for his security reasons he will change that room without the knowledge of the organizers because of his security. And I knew another one who also, he would change his cars. He would come in a simple way, walk, 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 and enter into a simple old taxi and go a distance and then get to another, another car and then another car and then finally his wonderful limous, limousines because you're always thinking somebody is following me and my security, my security, my security, my security. Now, when Asaf tells me that they have got no struggles and I can see there is no peace for the wicked, I, 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 I am totally taken by this, that a worship leader now cannot see properly. His perspectives are totally wrong because he has walked away from God. These are the problems of walking away from God. You can no longer see well. Your understanding is warped, totally confused that their bodies are healthy. Verse 5 says, they are free from common human burdens. It is not true. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers him out of them all. But the sinner also has got affliction without anybody to deliver him out of the afflictions. Verse 6, therefore pride is their necklace. That is true. They clothe with themselves with violence. That is true. I think you observed the right thing. From their calloused hearts comes iniquity. Evil, their evil imaginations have no limits. Again, that is very true. When you interact with a sinful world, you will find they've got a million and one ways to sin. And they're creating more. There are more, many, many more styles of sinning. They can sin and sin and continue to sin. And in fact, in the advent of, 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 uh, of, of the internet, I'm telling you there are many new innovative ways of committing sin until our government has now come up with a new law to limit the number of ways of sinning. We have to be limited because there is no limit. We have to be reg regulated and scared by harsh penalties. This one, Aliona Sawa, I think I agree with him on this one. Okay, my brothers are running away. What is happening here? They are afraid of this message. Verse, let me go very quickly. And, and I told you I get depressed reading uh, these verses. I'll go to verse 11. They say in verse 11, how would God know? They say God has no knowledge of what is happening to us. God will not know. Does the most high have in, know anything? They say he is totally blank. God does not know. He will not see. And so they continue singing, singing because their understanding is that God does not know. Verse 12. This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care. Carefree. They go on amassing wealth. And I thought... If you make this observation that Asaf is making, then you will say, my life then is better than their lives. But listen to what he says in verse 13. And picture your pastor, your patron, saying these kinds of things. The chaplain or the pastor here saying these kinds of things. Verse 13. Picture me saying, surely! Nimekuja testify kanisa na menipatia microphone. And, and verse 1, I told you, surely God is good. One day I told you like that. God is so good. Hallelujah. And you all went, amen, amen. Like I had an amen around here. And then another day, Nakuja Nase Mama Ze, surely. And this is not a debate. I'm telling you, surely. I've come to the conclusion because I've got 32 years' experience in salvation. And I'm old. Surely, verse 13, I have kept my heart pure in vain. It was useless that I walked in holiness. It was useless that I kept my heart pure and washed my hands to be innocent. Can you imagine telling the pastor telling you that there is no point of living a holy life? I mean, I would run away from that church. 
But in essence, this is what we're telling our pastors to do. When young people love to minimize the word of God in meetings like this ones, the shorter you preach, the better. Because we don't want the word of God. It is useless to teach us some of these things. It is better for us kukula happy and come even if it is church. We just only want to dance and be entertained and that's all that we're looking for. Surely I have kept my hands in innocence. It was all in vain that I was holy, that I was walking in righteousness. All those things were useless. My friend, when he spoke like that, the verses that follow unleashed terror on him according to his own testimony. You see, there was only one verse that he was doing very well. But all these 13 verses he's doing badly. Sin can take you so far because the devil is an opportunist. He give him a little chance like this one. He expands the whole territory. He wants to take the entire life. Verse 14 says, all day long I have been afflicted because of his, his position. I wish he came back to the Lord. All day long I have been afflicted. Every morning brings new punishments. Now picture this. You know these are statements we read quickly and we don't meditate on them. If the whole day this man feels that he has been afflicted from morning to evening. Yangu, yani tangu arusi ya jana yanze mpaka joni wakati wa reception. Nakumbuka hiyo arusi where everybody was glued to the TV like this. From the beginning of that wedding, when people are exchanging wonderful vows, where in mateso, afflictions, problems, depression. And then, it is not only depression during the day, verse 14 says, every morning brings new punishment. That means, I wake up in the morning, the whole night I have suffered, and I've had a hard time, and I begin the cycle all over again. Now, unajota badlisha wimbo, present worship, are you there? Instead of singing Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down, you'll be singing depression in the morning, depression in the noontime, depression. Depression when the sun goes down. In the morning, devil in the noontime, devil. Devil when the sun goes down. You, you, that is your testimony. Devil in the evening, devil in the midnight, devil. Devil when the sun rises. That is what this verse is saying here. Because he can't see the work of God in his life. He can't see the goodness of God in his life. There is nothing wonderful in his life. Listen to the word of the Lord. The way of a backslider is hard. That is what the scripture says in the Proverbs. The way of a backslider is hard. You try to go to the disco, they reject you there. They said, we saw you singing those choruses. You try to come among God's people, the Christians tell you, ah, sijana uluko wa disco, na umekuja hapa tena. How come? Upandembili, uko ndumakuili, unacheza huku na unacheza huku. What? So you're uncomfortable with the Christians because you're trying to hide what you're doing in the night, and you're uncomfortable there because they saw you preaching one day, and they saw you singing songs, and they saw you testifying, and they can't receive you in the disco hall. So you try everything. Your life is terribly miserable. The way of a backslider is hard. Just like the prodigal son. He decided, okay, me and Akula are happy because this thing of staying with dad around here and my elder brother, useless stuff. And he takes all this property, he goes and takes his inheritance before his time and goes and decides it is life to the maximum. And the first thing, I don't know why, but people, the, the world's best subject I've come to discover is sex. This young man, he went for the prostitutes. He went to have sex like nobody's business. After he took the money from Baba and Mama, akasema sasa ile nilikuwa nimefungiwa na walimu wa CU. Ile nilikuwa nimefungiwa na wale CU chairman. Mimi now I am free to mingle. And he went and took the prostitutes. He had sex. It was sex in the morning, sex in the noontime, and sex when the sun goes down. And in the night, and in the morning, it was his lifestyle. And he would pay anything for it. His entire inheritance got finished with sexual pleasures and when it got finished he discovered those were not true friends because they walked away from him and then as they walked away from him there was a famine in the land because the way of a backslider is hard you try backsliding today you will see all the relatives of the devil coming to you they'll first smile at you and give you pleasure boys wonderful tall dark and handsome 
And then they'll give you wonderful girls who have got wonderful shape of the body. And they smile. You can see the dental formula because you've got some money and you look so wonderful. Wait until that money goes away, that glamour goes away, and you begin to get wrinkles. And you're not as, as popular as you used to be because new versions, new models have come by. Then they walk away, and then there is a famine in the land. That guy, he ended up eating with pigs. Ngrue. One of the CU people was telling us before I came in here that when Jesus cast out demons, uh, the, the speaker who was here earlier actually was telling us that Jesus, when he cast out demons, they went into pigs. And so this guy, the pigs ran into the water quickly. So he says, when the devil enters you, you run. <coughs> you do things, crazy things that you never used to do before. And you do them quickly. In a short time, we shall maliza kila kitu. And so he ate with pigs. And you know, pigs can eat faster than you. And they eat dirty food, they eat faster. So the guy was trying to take this nguruwe isha chukwa. Na inamfanya how can you be liking to eat and something is making strange noises at you and it is smelling and eating terribly you know if you're told like you're eating like a pig man that you're not too simbaya so these pigs were eating and as young as the culture i call baba angry this 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 lifestyle it is not in my father's house and he began to meditate and he says in my father's house there used to be enough food and there used to be leftovers. Even for the servants who worked there, there was nothing like this. This life is hard. And Asaf is telling us the same. This life is hard. And I'm warning you today again, if you leave your position in the Lord, that life is hard. It is difficult to live outside Jesus. I want to live in Christ throughout my life because this is the life. This is the life. I like this life. There is a deliverer. He comes through for us. You suffer a little bit, then he comes and shields you and takes you out of the problems. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivers him out of them all. Hardship. But I'll tell you about the prodigal son a little bit later. Now, as I close. When verse 14 happened, the man is depressed. And verse 15, he speaks a profound word. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. What Asaf is saying is that the words that I speak and the things that are going on through my life and my heart as a mentor, if I verbalized everything that I was saying, it would have discouraged a younger generation. It would have misled a younger generation. So I'm speaking to you prophetically. Some of you are in the place of being mentored. But very soon you're going to be in a place of mentoring others. Your words are important. I say this. For those of us who are ministers and pastors, our hearts and the meditations of our hearts are the kitchens where the food of the children is cooked. The food which is the salmon, the word of God, the teachings that we bring is cooked in our hearts and in our meditations. And the things that we think about become food for millions of people because our lips speak what is in our hearts and we instruct people in righteousness. So Asaph was saying, the meditations that are upon my heart would eventually turn out to be a, would, would turn out to be a curse to a generation because I'm not thinking right. I'm going to affect people in a wrong way. And I want to speak to some of you already who are leaders. The things that you utter, the things that you do, some people are looking at you, some people are depending upon you and they rely on the words that proceed from your mouth. Speak what is valuable, God is going to use you. Speak what is constructive, God is going to use you. But speak things that are destructive, you're going to be used by the devil to break the hearts of so many people. May God use some people here today to bless many people. May God use some people to instruct other many people in your schools in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember very well in 1988, that same year that I came back, charged and encouraged. I went, I was in high school by then, my age is 47 right now as you look at me. I went to school and I began to speak in that Christian union. And I spoke and I asked the people, what will you do with Jesus, the son of God, who died on the cross for you? And there was a young man listening to that someone. And I came to him later on because he wanted to hear more. And I asked him, what will you do with Jesus who died for you? He went and meditated and came back and he says, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Today, many years later, he's a pastor in this city of Nairobi. He has been a missionary in Rwanda. He's a wonderful musician. He's a great man in ministry today. He taught in a Bible school where I went to. 
I became his student when he saw me coming to learn in the same school and he was a lower in, in high school he was in a lower class than myself but he went on and studied theology long before me and then I came to study my theology Bible later on I found that he was a malimu in this college and when he saw me he says how can a teacher teach a teacher <laughs> and he gave me one of his classes to teach while I was a student and I gladly taught alongside him and I tell you the impact continues I want you to see yourself as a mentor as one who is going to bless the lives of so many people by the things that you say and the things that you do. You will bless a generation. And so that verse 15 is very important that the things that we put in giggle, garbage in, garbage out. But precious stuff in, you bring out precious stuff out which is going to bless the nations. Let's bring this to a conclusion now. When verse 16 says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. Now, this is the flesh when I try to understand all this. And the key word there for me is I, myself, without God. I try to get an understanding with the absence of the Lord. He's still showing us this side. That there are moments he walks without the presence of God. He's showing us the weak side. There's, that sometimes he walks in the flesh without consulting Jehovah. He's trying to solve problems on his own. He's trying to chart his way through life without consulting the Lord. Dangerous. When you try to do that, it becomes oppressive because you're spiritually blind. You're unable to help yourself. You're unable to pick yourself from the quagmire where the enemy has dropped you. It is impossible for you to pick yourself. And I've come here to, to speak to some people here today. And I say to you, I know that some of you are stuck in some situation. Masturbation is one of them where young people are stuck and they do not know how to get out of it. When you try to understand it, when you try to do it on your own, you cannot do it. I recommend to you what the Lord says. He says, come to me. All you that labor and are heavily laden, I will give you rest. It is not by might. It is not by power. It is by the Spirit of the Lord. You cannot save yourself. It is the Spirit of God that is going to help you. The grace of God is going to lift you up. And you do not come to the Lord ready. You do not come to the Lord fixed. You stop drinking. You stop smoking. You stop drugs. You stop betting. You stop all those habits of masturbation and in, in, in immorality. You, you come as you are. He says, come with your burdens of guilt. Come with your burdens of addiction. Come with your burdens and bondages. I will give you rest. He tried to do it on his own. He could not do it. It became oppressive to him. And he was going lower and sinking lower in depression every moment. Like the prodigal son was sinking lower and lower and lower every moment. And so you ask me, so what do I do? I want to gladly answer that question with a simple illustration that I have. There's one time in Nairobi, I did not tell you that I was born in this city, so this is, this is my home. I was born out here in Gara, I was raised up around this area. And so one day, a group of us young people, there was one of us who had a vehicle, and we put ourselves, many of us, on a Sunday morning, and we said we were going to church. And we drove down Gong Road, Gong Road coming towards Nairobi Baptist Church around the Daystar University, around that area. We came and heckling and making noise in this vehicle. We were so many of us in a small Citroen car. Those Citroens that used to sit down when they're off and they stand up when they're on. You know those Citroens? They are no, I can no longer see them here around here. So we were in this Citroen, K-U-U. -U, and we came down the road. And the driver, also a young man, very excited like the rest of us, so excited. And almost 100% of us, sanguines, no quiet person. All of us, rowdy and noisy. And some were saying, okay, okay, if you can hop around about, turn left because we are going to Valley Road Church for the service today. And another one says, no, we have to turn. We go straight on because we're going to go to town. We're going to a redeemed gospel church. Another one says, turn to the other side. There's a church in Bagadi. We're going to that Bagadi church. Another one says, no, we passed another church up here, Good Shepherd. We have to turn back and go this other way. So the driver reached the roundabout. And the debate was going on. What he decided is to go round the roundabout. Round the roundabout. 
round the round about round the round about and he went on kizunguzungu kaanza kutushika jameni tunaenda tu round the round about mwingine anasema redeemed mwingine anasema deliverance mwingine anasema npc mwingine anasema sijui mbagadhi kulikuwa na kanisa lingine huko ah and round and tukashikwa na hii kizunguzungu until one of us shouted redeemed and this man hata nimeshikwa na kizunguzungu wake nimeshikwa naye kidogo he he said redeemed and so everybody kept quiet and we came down to town Can you say that down to town if you're a mluya don't try Utaniambia hapa vitu vingine town to town Na kama we ni mkikuyu usijaribu kusema shirika la reli la Rwanda utaleta matatizo hapa shirika la reli la reli la Rwanda utatletea shida So we we came town to town <laughs> town to town That story I see that roundabout as a prodigal son who is at crossroads in his life and Asaph who is also at crossroads in his life and I'm saying that to illustrate verse 17 the prodigal son thank god at the roundabout you can either go on straight ahead and continue in your sinning ways and continue to be impure because those who are impure the bible says continue to be impure still those who are righteous continue to be righteous still so you can continue on and become a worse sinner than you you've ever been or you take some shortcuts of hiding to this other side and decide okay i'm going to hide i'll not go straight on i'll look like i'm a nice guy i'll just go this other side and turn my life or go this other side and turn my life but there is also another decision you can decide to go around the roundabout and go back to up ngong road where the journey started and recalibrate and think about what your life is all about and decide from where you started where you want to go before you make a decision around that roundabout and this is what verse 17 is saying to us 16 says that he was depressed but verse 17 says till i entered the sanctuary of god That means I went round like the prodigal son and went round and round and round away. there is no other way other than to go back to that place of meditation in verse 1 which says God is good to Israel and those that are of a pure heart when I left that position and that understanding and that lifestyle of living for God in holiness trouble started in my life but i had to go round the roundabout round the roundabout round the roundabout i tried to understand myself i tried the philosophies i tried pleasure i tried my own friends i tried all these things that i have tried fashion design hiding hypocrisy pride i tried all those things to live like those other people but they all failed me and i'm here to tell you that even boyfriends are going to fail you girlfriends are going to fail you all sorts of pleasures are going to fail you but jesus never fails Jesus will keep you on the straight and the narrow. Clap your hands to Jesus. Round and round the roundabout until I entered the sanctuary of God and the things that I could not understand before then I understood where my eyes were closed before and my eyes began to open again. I finally understood the destiny of this wicked people that I'm admiring. They are not going in a nice place because verse 18 tells me surely you place them on a slippery ground you cast them down to ruin the same people are admiring the lifestyle are admiring look at what god does to them you place them on slippery ground and cast them down to ruin they're going in a bad place they're going in a wrong direction and this man concludes towards the end of the psalm I like the way it says surely in verse 13 and then verse 18 it says surely you place them on slippery ground you cast them down in ruin suddenly they are destroyed completely swept away by terror they are like a dream when one awakes when you arise lord you will despise them as fantasies when my heart was grieved my spirit was embittered i was senseless and ignorant i was a brute beast before you he's repenting which i'm calling upon your people to repent here today and bring a revival of brokenness and holiness and sanctity and purity in your lives brokenness is going to bring you to this place and he says i was embittered in my spirit this is brokenness i was a brute beast 
Yes, I am always with you. Yet I'm always with you, with you. You hold me, my right hand, you hold it. You guide me with your counsel and afterwards you will take me into glory. He's now seeing correctly that when he comes to the Lord, there is an eternity. There is an eternal perspective. He's going to live with the Lord forever. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are afar from me will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. And I like the, verse, the last verse. It says, but as for me. You see, verse 2 says, but as for me. And then this last verse says again, but as for me. While well, they are getting destroyed, but as for me. When they are on the slippery ground, but as for me. When they walk away from the Lord, but as for me, it is good to be near God. And before I finish that verse, I need to ask you, and actually inform me, not even ask you, did you know that not everybody who is seated in this room is going to finish this Christian journey well? The people you started with in Christianity, some of them have already fallen by the wayside. I'm asking you most solemnly in this hall today if God keeps us and we meet again when you're not in that school uniform or in this campus 10 years from today will you have a testimony for Jesus the way that you might be having it today 10 years 2028 from today will I meet you in 2038 if God keeps us and you still have a testimony for Jesus after 30, 20 years from now, 2048, if you have a vision to live that far, will you still have a testimony for Jesus 30 years from here? May that word disturb you today. May that word go with you today that you will maintain a walk by the grace of God to serve him faithfully and maintain a righteous life not by your own strength but by the grace of God by the help of the Holy Spirit and in obedience to the scriptures that you will walk in tandem with what the Spirit wills and what the word of God demands that verse says but as for me it is good to be near God I want to be in the presence of the living God I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge I will tell all I will tell I will tell all your deeds it means that he's going to preach about the great things that the Lord is doing in his life. I want to end this message by giving you a solemn charge. Where are you at in this whole journey? Psalm 73. A great mentor, a great man. Are you a mentor? Consider to be somebody else's mentor. Do not say that I'm only in high school. I cannot help somebody else. There is somebody who is spiritually lower than yourself. You can help them. And look up to somebody else like Asaph looked up to David and David was able to help him and hone his skill and his talent and his abilities in the Lord. Look up to somebody else as you mentor other people. Asaph, a mentor, showing us the good side and the bad side of his life. Are you able to be honest with a few? Don't expose yourself to everybody. But at least a few whom you can share your life with. And people like it when you're real when you're honest with them, to share the real truth about your life. What are your struggles? Open up those two sides like the Apostle Paul tells us that I have a thorn in the flesh. I've prayed about this thing three times. God says it is not coming out, but the grace is sufficient. That is First, Second Corinthians chapter 12. And I also charge you, my brothers and sisters, in your secret struggles, are you able to bring these things before the Lord honestly and deal with them most honestly? Because there are three people you can never cheat. One is the devil. Two is your conscience. And three, you can never cheat the almighty God. The devil knows your conscience will condemn you and the, and, and the God almighty who created you, he sees what you do behind closed doors. He sees what you do in the dark hours where nobody sees you, away from your teachers, away from your lecturers, away from your parents, away from everybody who can see you. The Lord knows. There's three. Your conscience, the devil and God. No. Can we be honest and say, I want a healing, a deliverance, a freedom from this kind of life. I want to walk with the Lord. Have you gone so far? Where are you at in this journey? You started by looking upon God. You were very vibrant some years back. But now you've fallen by the wayside. No longer walking with God. You used to pray. 
You used to fast. You used to read the Bible even five chapters a day. You no longer read that book. It is not something that excites you anymore. You've got no appetite for the things of God. Coming to meetings like this one, you're coming because it's an outing of the school and you want an atmosphere away from the school. Not really that you're interested in the things of God. Can you be honest and tell the Lord, I need that fire rekindled. I need that zeal and desire for the things of God rekindled in my life. I want to live a pure and honest life before God because I want to attract the favor and the goodness of the Lord. If you've fallen and you're backslidden, there is enough grace to restore you here today. God is able to restore. I believe in being as simple as that and making a challenge for the Lord. I close my books and I ask you, please stand together with me in this auditorium as you make this prayer more solemnly before the Lord Almighty. I want to bring this case before God concerning your life and allow him to walk through our lives. Let's bow down before him and be honest before the living God. There are so many of you in this auditorium but I want to ask for two categories of people to pray for. The first set of people that I want to pray for is those that are saying that I've never known a relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't really have a personal relationship with God. And I really want to have that relationship with God. I don't want to go away from this rally without that relationship with God. If you're there and you're saying that I'm also among those people who once knew the Lord but have backslidden, my fire has gone down and I want to be revived again. If you fall in those two categories of people before I pray for the third category, just slip your hand up like that. I will pray for you and the love of God will be all over you. Raise it up high so that the Lord Almighty, thank you, thank you. Raise them up high, sons and daughters of the kingdom of God that are going to be revived. Raise them up high. The Holy Spirit sees you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I love you with the love of God. And those of you who are making that prayer, just make your way to the front. I want to pray with you at this altar. Quietly just move from your areas of sitting and come. You're the first ones that I want to pray for this afternoon. From up there, from every side, you're quite a lot of you whose hands are raised up. Come and stand with me here at the altar as we bring it before the Lord. He revives, he saves, he sustains. He's able to keep you from your youth to the day that you die with gray hair on your head, but you will walk with the Lord. I can see both university students, I can see high school students being honest before God. I really feel moved and touched when I'm among people who are honest with themselves and honest with the Lord, that we can make things right before the Almighty God. I need my life to be pleasing and acceptable to the Lord our God. Yes, stream here to the front. Let's make it right before the Lord our God. And as you come right here, the Lord is full of grace and full of mercy. He does not embarrass. He does not want to expose you. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. Is there any more of you who are coming? Please come quickly because I'm about to lead these ones in a prayer that is going to lead them in the presence of the living God. Are you coming? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just raise your hands over to the Lord our God. And for their sake, I want the entire church to just raise their hands over to them and pray for them. I see honest people here who are willing to turn their lives to Jesus, who want and desperately need Jesus to come into their lives. Just repent your sins as you raise your hands to the Lord. Ask him to forgive you your sins and ask him to revive your life and to bring you back to the place of vibrancy, to bring you back to the place of effectiveness, a place of loving the Lord and serving him again. Talk to him with your own mouth and in your own language in the way that you only can express to him. 
I, 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 I do not have a problem if you begin to cry before the Lord. I see those tears, my sister. God saves. The Lord saves. The Lord heals the pain that you've gone through, the issues that you've gone through in your life that have thrown you down, the shame, the embarrassment that you've gone through. God will save you. God will deliver you. God will heal you. He restores us and he saves to the utmost. Father, you see the hearts of these young people who are crying out to you, Lord, this afternoon and are calling to you from the depths of their hearts, O oh Lord. Hear our cry. Hear our plea. Hear our thoughts, O oh Lord, from afar off. Lord, heal our pain. Help us, O oh Lord, to come back. Help us to come to the place again where we stand in fellowship with you, Lord. We abide in the true vine. We abide in you, Lord, that you will save us. You will help us. You will heal us. And take us, O oh Lord, to the place of vibrancy in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to lead you in a prayer. I want to lead you in a prayer. Come, my sister. Come. Are you able to come up here? No, it's okay. Just stand right there. God sees these tears in your eyes. And there's so many things that have happened in your life, but God restores you today. The pain, the shame, the embarrassment. You feel like you failed God and failed your friends and your people. But God restores you. And he wipes away those tears from your eyes. There is grace. There is forgiveness in the name of Jesus. God will wipe away your tears, my sister, in Jesus' name. All of us here at the front, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I have walked away from your ways. And today I come back. I come back to the cross. I come back to you. I repent my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to wash me with your blood. And I open my heart. And ask you Jesus. To come into my life. Every room of my life. Every area of my life. My secret life my private life come and rule shine your light write my name Lord in the book of life I confess before the congregation that I'm a child of God I confess before heaven and earth that I believe in Jesus who died who was buried who rose from the dead and is alive forevermore I am a child of God. I am born again. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you, church, to just raise your voice for these ones as I pray for them. God is saving them with great convictions in the name of the Lord. God is saving these people with a great conviction in the name of Jesus. It is not a small thing when you begin to see young people like this, my brother. God is going to wipe away all tears from your eyes. And what's your name? Robinson. Robinson. Yes. The conviction that God has put on your heart is real. And you're going to go many years of service, serving the Lord faithfully because of deep conviction and deep commitment to Jesus. Be faithful to the Lord. You will see great things in your life. You will see great things in your life. And that goes for all of you in Jesus' name. That the Lord will give you glory. He will give you honor. He will allow you to see greatness in your lives as you continue to serve him faithfully. Church, I want you to thank God for these people. And you that are here, I want you to just thank God that he has saved you. 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 Amen. Let me ask a general question. I almost feel like I want to ask the three girls that are here. Is any of you willing to share with us just a glimpse of where you've been and where you believe God is taking you to right now? Any of you? Us have shared both sides, the good and the bad. I know some of these things are difficult to share. But any of you willing to share? You want to? Come, jump up here just for a while. You can put your hands down.
your name? I'm Jafet. Jafet. Yeah. Yes. What happens in your life? Okay. I was trying to fight with um, sexual addiction. Let me hold it for you. Uh, but after this service, I was actually not to come here. I was here in the morning, but I met some friends of mine. That service really touched me. I ran in my car in Mkono, but conscious. I feel like I cannot fight this thing alone. I really need to give it to a higher power. I used to serve well. I used to be high school president, school president. But after joining campus, I don't know what happened to me. I don't. I used never used to like see you. Used to have my other things, participating in any. But I think it's the high time for me to change. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. My brothers, it is not easy to stand before a group of people like this and say, I was bound in sexual addiction, I am walking out. And this is part of the deliverance because he has declared it with his mouth. He has declared it with his mouth. And that higher power is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He delivers you from this moment onwards. You will not go back in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Who is your best friend among these people here? I have two of them, Josiah and Steve. Are they here? Yeah, they are here. Josiah and Steve, where are you? Josiah and Steve, come. Very quickly. Come and stand here. Come and stand next to them. Let's clap for Josiah and Steve. Stand next to them. Amen. The power of verbalizing it is amazing and mighty. Amen. Some of you in this congregation are touched by what is happening here. And I know deliverance is also happening right over there as you're also making up your mind that I'm walking out of that addiction in the name of Jesus. Any other person who would like to say, just give us a glimpse, not maybe not in the details, but just give us a glimpse of what God is doing in your life right now. Any of you that is willing. I only have one courageous person. None of you. My sisters, are you willing to share with us even just a little bit of what God is doing in your life to encourage other sisters? Are you? Okay, we'll give them time. It is very hard to stand before people. My brothers, hold the hands of this man. Hold the hands of this man. Your name, you said uh, Japheth. Stretch your hands to Japheth as we send angels to accompany him in this journey. Father, I pray for Japheth in the name of Jesus. The Lord, you will shield him and tuck him in every side. Help him in, in every side, O oh God. That the enemy shall not see him. That the enemy shall not touch him. Father, we pray for full deliverance from sexual addiction in the name of Jesus. I break the chains. I break the bondage that is upon his life in this area of sexual addiction. In the name of Jesus. And I set him free. I set him free. I set him free. I set him free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. My brothers, have you overcome sexual addiction yourselves? Personally, I have learned the art of trusting in God and knowing that God has set everything at its time in Ecclesiastes 3. The word of God tells us everything has its own time in trusting Let me ask you, God. Have you overcome sexual addiction in your life? Yeah. You have? Yeah. My brother, have you overcome sexual addiction in your life? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Why are your eyes looking the other side? <laughs> you know, my, my major is in psychology. <laughs> I'm looking at your eyes. Have you overcome? Yes. You have. Now, I will believe you for your word. I want you to, to have these two gentlemen as your accountability partners. When temptation comes, speak to this man, speak to this man and say, I am in trouble. Come. I'm not doing this. I am not going that direction. Come and rescue me. And take me somewhere else. Speak to me now and speak to him the word of the Lord. Do you hear me? You are your brother's keeper from this moment onwards. You are going to walk with him in the name of the Lord. He will not go the way of Asaph. The problem of Asaph is that he was walking alone. But this Asaph is not going to walk alone. You've got angels that are going to go with you. 
walk him down the aisle, walk him down the stairs here and go with him in the newness of life in Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord. Now listen to this. As we give glory to God, I need to ask you a question. How many of you have come to accept Jesus Christ for your very first time today? You've never accepted Jesus Christ before. Raise up your hand. This is your first time. All right? It is, that's, that's one of them. Let's clap to Jesus because of that one. You are born again. What's your name? What? Come, come, come closer to me. Come this way. Come, come right here in the center. Tell me your name. Your name? Her name is Rachel. Look at all these people. The crowd is wonderful there. Just stand and look at all of them. Can you? Lovely people. Let's clap for Rachel who has accepted Jesus for the very, very first time. Now, is it my understanding that those of you who are not accepting Christ for the first time, you had backslidden and you've come back to the Lord today? Just raise your hand if that is your case today. You're not walking with the Lord. All right. The majority of you, almost all of you. Let's also clap our hands for the prodigal sons and the daughters of God that have come to the house of the Lord our God. Turn around and look at those people. Turn around and look at those people. Turn around and look at them. All right. Do they look wonderful? Do they have a smile on their face? I know that some of them have been crying here, but they look wonderful, isn't it? Now, look at them very carefully. Very carefully. How many of you can see here in the front somebody that you personally know and you can call her or you can call him your friend? Look very well. If you can call somebody your friend. All right. Now, those of you who are raising hands up there, I want you to come so quickly and pick that person. You're going to be their companion in the journey of faith. Do not leave them. Take them to where you're seated. Take them with you. I want to see who remains here. And do not leave this place unless you're picked by at least one person. Let's see who remains here. Take them to where you're seated. And fellowship begins, begins now. Fellowship begins now. You're not walking alone. Fellowship begins now. Mentorship begins now. Oh, yes. Some of you know. You have been taken by two. That's very nice. He has been taken by two. All right. You have been taken by one. Wonderful. Go with her. And you're walking with her. That is your accountability partner. You're not backsliding again. You're going to walk with the Lord from this day forward. Amen. Young people picking young people. Even if you're two of you picking one person, it's okay. Now, you, the rest of you who are left here, I'm going to pose the question again. Do you see these four people who are here? Is there anybody in this crowd who knows them? I can see somebody coming there. All right. What's your name? You almost forgot your name, eh? And what's her name? You will know her name today. <laughs> the three of these gentlemen are sit standing here. You want to tell me that nobody in this congregation knows them? Nobody considers them their friend? How bad were they? Even if they were so bad, they have changed today. Are you coming from one of them? Amen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Are you the Malimu? Wonderful. These are your boys. Wonderful. Amen. God is so good. God is so good. Let's clap for Malimu. What's your name, Malimu? Oh, this is our... This is, you're my hero today. You're my hero, Malimu. You have taken responsibility of three of them. Amen. God bless you. What's your name, Malimu? I'm Paul Manzian. Paul Manzian. These boys, you know them. Yes. You know what they were before. I have an idea. I have an idea. They are in your hands. Yes. Disciple them, teach them, and show them how to walk in the Lord. Amen. Let's clap for Paul Manzia in Jesus' name. Walk with Malimo and sit with him in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 I'll make one prayer. I know I've taken all the time, but I need to make this one prayer for all of us to make this practical. We want to walk in holiness 
We want to walk in accountability. We want to be used by God. How many of you are saying you want both dimensions of being mentored by somebody else and to mentor somebody else at the same time? You want to be helped by somebody else, a King David in your life, and you are the Asaph who is helping us, the sons of Asaph. You want to be helped and you're praying that God gives you a mentor and you're also praying that God gives you a mentee. If you're there, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. It's practically all of us. Practically all of us. Can I ask you, in the solemnness of this meeting, just to bow down your heads, raise both of your hands before the Lord our God, and begin to ask God to send you a mentor. Bring somebody in your life who's going to help you spiritually. Bring somebody across your path who is gifted and anointed and be able to find time for you. Somebody who is going to walk with you in the walk of faith. Somebody who is going to mentor you professionally, even educationally. Somebody who is going to teach you the ways of righteousness. The person who is going to inspire your life. And as you pray that, pray also that God will give to you sons and daughters in the faith. People that you will impact. And as you impact the lives of other people, God is going to fill your life with greatness. And greater things will happen because you're giving and you will receive. You're giving your time, you will receive the time of somebody else. You're giving your knowledge, you will receive the knowledge from somebody else. You're giving your experience, somebody else will give and pour the experience into your life. Father, may this come to pass, O oh God, as we pour out our lives in our Timothys, in our Titus, in our Joshuas, in our Elishas. May you raise up Elijahs in our lives. May you raise up Apostle Pauls in our lives. May you raise up Moseses in our lives. We who are Joshuas, Lord, we want to have mentors as we mentor other people, Lord. Help us to mentor. Help us to help. Help us to be helpers of destinies. Destiny, help us here to Today, Lord, raise us to become, raise us to become, raise us to make, raise us, oh God, to help, raise us, Father, to identify and spot talents in other people, to help others to live for you and inspire them and spur them for righteousness and glory. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we go forth from this auditorium, in a short while from now, Lord, we pray for the flames of passion, the passion to serve you, the passions to learn, the passion to glean more on the things of God, the passion to tap into what others have and have acquired through experience walking with you for many years. Lord, we pray that you will fill our lives and help us to have people like Paul and Gamaliel in our lives, oh Lord. Help us, oh God, to have mentors like Moses to Joshua. Lord, we pray that you bring our Moseses along our paths now. We pray that you will connect us as you connected Elijah and Elisha, oh God. That there will be generation after generation of people who serve you in giftedness, in holiness, in righteousness, in purity of heart. The law, the generation of the righteous shall not come to an end, but there will be a remnant in every generation, Father, of university students, of high school students, law that will pass on this baton from generation to generation, from teacher to teacher, from one generation of teachers to the other. We pray specifically for our teachers, O oh God, who are the pastors of these young people, Father, a special anointing upon our CU patrons and chaplains. Lord, anoint them for the duties that they discharge among our students as mentors and as role models. Yet we also pray, Father, that you help us to identify others who need our help. That we will be those fathers, those mothers, those encouragers, those Barnabases who help to bring up Paul the Apostle and raise him up to become an Apostle who is effective in the work of God. Father, help us to mentor others. Give us our cults. We are the horses. We want the colts that we're going to mentor. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer and helping us to continue the generation of righteousness until we finish the fight and finish the race and keep the faith. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Clap your hands to Jesus.
Clap your hands to Jesus. Clap your hands to Jesus with a voice of triumph. With a voice of triumph. God is so good. God is so good. From generation to generation, God is good. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I don't want to go without helping you to understand that some of the places, some of you meet us for the first time and it is usually the last time to meet us. But I pray that God will help us to meet again and inspire one another. And I've asked you 10 years today from today, would you, would you be serving the Lord as effectively as you are serving him now and even more? I'm usually found on Ngong Road. I have an office at a certain church there that has given me a space to do my private practice in counseling, psychology. I've seen all sorts of people ranging from addictions and ranging from suicidal tendencies, going all the way to marital cases and all sorts of counseling situations, and even people who are just thinking about their careers and all sorts of things. Feel very free to come to Friends International Ngong Road. It's, off, off, uh, it's, it's opposite. The, it's between Uchumi Hyper and uh, Prestige, those, uh, those two uh, stations, those two uh, supermarket areas, and opposite Good Shepherd Church on Gongro. That's where you'll find Edwin Gaira, and, 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 and I will be available for you. Otherwise, we meet on radio uh, on Sunday morning on Radio Citizen at 7.30 in the morning to 9 in the morning. That's where I usually do uh, my main ministry to the public through mass media. So God bless you so much. I really appreciate the chaplain and the leadership of the Christian Union. Thank you for the honor and thank you for the honor of all of you just being here and having fellowship with me. Thank you so much. God bless you.